Kia uh, ora So it gives me great pleasure on behalf of Bofama School to introduce Antwi Akom, uh, Akom <laughs> uh, to this session. Um, so growing up, disruption or being disruptive wasn't something you really wanted on your report card, but it does seem that today, you know, we live pretty much um, our daily lives with forms of disruption, whether it be of the natural variety, as Christchurch has um, so greatly experienced, or through our technology, food, or transport. And social disruption is also pretty much um, part of our daily lives these days, uh, whether that's um, through media and news, or just, in fact, the way we experience our daily lives. Antwi Akom um, is very well placed to confront us um, in terms of the social disruption um, his practice is global in nature. As professor, pr professor and founding director of Social Innovation Lab and co-founder CEO of Streetwise, his um, practice really does have a global reach, and we're very pleased and, in fact, privileged to have him here um, to talk to us. So without further ado, um, Antwi, please come to the stage. Thanks. Well, uh, greetings, New Zealand. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be here. So I'm grateful, grateful for those of you who stayed uh, all day to, to listen. I'm sure it's been a long day. So thank you for coming out. Um, today, I really want to talk about um, designing for spatial and racial justice. And I want to start with a confession. <laughs> I'm not a landscape architect. That's the end of my talk. <laughs> Uh, I am a sociologist, I'm a technologist, I'm an epidemiologist, and a data scientist. And some have called me a so-called eco-visionary, but that's really a term for all of you. Uh, but they've called me that and referred to me in those terms because of the way that my work is really rooted in communities, in engagement, in technology, and in bottom-up innovation. Um, and today, I want to start this conversation with you all really wearing my sociology hat. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, but he comes to America from France and he talks about democracy in America, sort of this insider-outsider status. And I think that's kind of my relationship with you all today is this insider-outsider status. And I want to talk to you all about decolonizing landscape architecture and democratizing uh, landscape architecture. And with my social science hat on, I want to start off by putting forward kind of two paradoxes for you all to think about today. The first paradox that you all know so well, but it's really helpful when people remind you, is that the built environment is a reflection of our cultural values, our landscapes are infused and imbued with our cultural memories, but it's really whose values, whose memories, whose identities, whose ideas are being represented, and why. And I want to give you an example of what I mean. When I left California, I think two days ago, I don't know, I'm, I'm, time is kind of messed up right now. Um, but what I do recall really well, th thank you, my brother, um, is that we didn't, have any, we didn't have any electricity because of the wildfires. Right, so we have no electricity, no power, um, and it's been really interesting what's happening in California. I think in many ways, what's going on in California is representative of the way that the entire United States is headed. And I think part of my conversation with you all today is to kind of talk about and be future looking and forward looking. I think in terms of electricity, New Zealand's doing way better than the United States. You all get 80% of your power, 80% uh, of your electricity from renewable sources. We're not there yet. But around the world, there's over a billion folks who aren't getting any electricity. And in California, things are only getting worse. We've got historic winds causing unprecedented fires. We've got 50,000 people that were ordered to evacuate. We've got 3 million people uh, going on right now without power. And the implications of all of this are really quite important and massive. Um, we've got people walking around, including myself and my own children, 
wearing these air masks, people can't breathe, the air quality is decreased for everyone. And learning to live without electricity uh, is really becoming the new normal. Parts of it really feel like and look like Armageddon. When you go to grocery stores to buy groceries, there's nothing available in the grocery store. You'd have to drive a million miles to get the groceries that you need. And in some ways, it's made living really challenging and really hard. And what's less, I think, visible is the way that the blackouts are impacting people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses. People are dying, uh, especially people from low-income communities and communities of color. There was a man uh, who had cardiopulmonary disease. They turned the power off, couldn't get any oxygen, passes away. Right? So these are really life and death issues. And I'm going to speak to you all about some of my work with the homeless populations later. But when, when I spoke to them about this and went into the homeless camp, they're like, we've been living like this for a long time, so stop complaining. But my point in, in starting there was really to say that your work in so many ways is about placemaking. And you all really can't talk about placemaking without talking about racemaking and its impact on spaces and places. And I think placemaking with vulnerable populations is increasingly really a lost art. I think we've gotten really good at placemaking for the 1%, but not with the 100%. And I think the real challenge of the 21st century for designers and landscape architects and planners is how do we really begin to integrate community voice and lived experience into planning processes with vulnerable populations who have been locked out of sustainability conversations, smart city conversations, shareable city conversations, and social justice conversations Will we create built environments and natural ecosystems for rich people or for poor people, for people of color or for white folks, for eco-haves or eco-have-nots? And who will have a say in how we design and redesign our landscapes of the future, powerful elites or everyday people? And all of this is important because when scientists and designers and landscape architects think of climate change. We often think of global warming and we talk about parts per million. We talk about things like polar bears and melting ice caps or things like hard infrastructure like electrical grids and transit networks or water lines. And the goal is really to reduce carbon and technology and economic solutions are the quick fix. But when low-income communities and communities of color and vulnerable populations think of climate change, we think of it really differently. We think about the impact on our neighborhoods, on our daily lives, asthma, health disparities. We analyze the connections between the abuse of the environment and the abuse of community in terms of access to opportunity. And I think a great way to sort of uh, capture this dynamic that I'm lifting up for you is Eric Kleinenberg's book. He's a professor at NYU, Heat Wave. In 1995, the United States goes through the, the worst heat wave in its history. And he writes this book really doing what he called a social autopsy of Chicago. And his central thesis is he wants to know why did so many elderly people end up dying alone during the heat wave? And what role did resiliency, social capital, social cohesion play in who lived and who died? And he analyzes these two black neighborhoods that are similarly situated. He's got the Inglewood neighborhood that has a really good reputation in the city, but it has disconnected social services. So it's hemorrhaging. First it loses its employment, then it loses its grocery stores, its banks, its community centers. And in the Inglewood neighborhood, people retreat into their homes and they end up baking like they were in an oven. Then he goes to another part of the city that has this horrible reputation. This is the hoodie hood part of the city. And yet, because it has activated sidewalks and social networks, because it has strong community bonds, people end up surviving the heat wave. And what he concludes is, and this is in Wired magazine, 
If you want to survive climate change, you'll need a good community. And it turns out the variable that best explains mortality is social infrastructure. Sidewalks, community organizations, active commercial corridors, it's the strength of the neighborhood that, de that determines who lives and who dies. So I'm hoping that you all can start thinking about reframing resiliency and this idea of resiliency, from surviving resiliency, which is so much about emergency preparedness, to thriving resiliency, which is how do you really build social capital, social cohesion, and social connectedness with some of our most vulnerable populations. And if you want to design for equity, to me, it's not enough to ask, how can we build healthier spaces and places? How can we build happier spaces and places? How can we build greener spaces and places? without first looking at the real structural inequalities in terms of race, class, gender, immigration, and other areas of intersectionality and how they've created the built environment that we live in. How do we design and redesign spaces and places not for but with communities that are experiencing unimaginable forms of social trauma, have limited access to food, unprecedented, suffering from unprecedented environmental threats, and I refer to all of this as eco-apartheid. And what eco-apartheid, this is from an article that I wrote, Teachers College Press, uh, Columbia University, 2011. Eco-apartheid is a systems theory that examines the ecological impacts of structural racialization. It highlights the ways that structures and institutions cumulatively cause unequal built environment and health benefits and burdens based on race, class, gender, immigration, and those intersectionalities. Blah, 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 right? So what does eco-apartheid mean? All right, so what, what I'd like for you all to do is everyone close your eyes for a minute, go into your eco-imagination, and I want to sort of take you on a journey with me that kind of begins to unpack what I mean by eco-apartheid. So as your eyes are closed, I want you to imagine that you are all dark-skinned, black kids growing up in West Oakland or I think in Christ Church it could be like Linwood, right? So keep that on the side, but think about West Oakland for now. All right, open your eyes. Feels good to be black, doesn't it? Some of you are like, dang, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Should have done that a long time ago, Antwi. <laughs> right, all right, so. You're all black kids, we're all going to school in West Oakland. And I want to know how many grocery stores do you think there are in our neighborhood in West Oakland? And since you're black, what we do in our tradition is it's call and response. So when I say how many grocery stores, just yell out some numbers. Take your best guess. Three? Three grocery stores? None. All right. Good, 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 good. Very good. So depending on how you draw the boundaries of our neighborhood, there's between one and two grocery stores in our neighborhood in West Oakland, right? Remember, we're talking about eco-apartheid, we're talking about cumulative causation, right? And how many liquor stores are there in our neighborhood? More than 12. More than 20. More than 28. Thank you, right. So depending on how you draw the boundaries of our neighborhood, there's between 50 and 60 or liquor stores in our neighborhood. Remember, we're talking about eco-apartheid. We're talking about cumulative causation, right? And so we're all black youth, black and brown youth. We're on our way to school. Where are we most likely going to stop to get food? Thank you, right? That's the available food to us, the liquor store. And what kind of food are we going to eat? Chips. Chips. Chocolate, hmm, we're getting kind of bougie about it. <laughs> Dark chocolate, for that matter. <laughs> Why not? What else? Give me two more. Twinkies. Twinkies, yes. They last forever, right? <laughs> they have a shelf life of forever. A lot of the stuff some of us still have in our pockets or our purse or wherever, right? But we know we're going to load up on all these kinds of carbohydrates and foods that aren't healthy for us, right? And on our way to school, what is the race and the gender, this is in the United States, remember, 
But what is the race and the gender of the majority of teachers in urban schools? Don't be shy. Am I shy? Don't be shy. Just say it. White, good start. You're, you're, you're hot. White what? White women, thank you. And there's nothing wrong with white women. We love all people. We want to lift up all boats, right? But it is to say that the people who teach in the school don't look like any of us. They come from a different background than us, right? Right? So we're talking about eco-apartheid. We're talking about cumulative causation, right? So when we go into the classroom and we sit down in our class and we can't sit down because we're all sugared up, what is the general diagnosis for us black and brown children? Thank you. That's it. That's eco-apartheid, right? That's cumulative causation. Right? So in an eco-apartheid analysis, the outcome that we were just diagnosed with ADHD, we were just put on Ritalin for the rest of our life, right? our whole, traje whole trajectory could have just been changed because of this diagnosis, because of a structural issue. The teachers are well-meaning. Right? This has nothing to do with well-meaning teachers. This has to do with the structure of our neighborhood. Right? So that's eco-apartheid. And why is eco-apartheid important? Eco-apartheid suggests that environmental bads like toxic waste are in low-income communities, poor neighborhoods, communities of color, while environmental goods like open space and parks are in wealthier neighborhoods. Is that true here in New Zealand? Absolutely it's true, right? Eco-apartheid also suggests that it's a more powerful definition than environmental racism, precisely because it captures inequalities beyond race including space, place, and waste. For example, the urban grocery gap, the fresh produce gap, the transportation gap, while simultaneously centering race, racism, and their political implications. Third, eco-apartheid suggests that policy is not neutral, and it captures the racialization and the spatialization of inequality. And I'm going to walk you through what that would mean in the United States, and then try to put it in a New Zealand context. Right? But the history of the United States, and this is in the words of Tim Wise, is the history of systematic, institutionalized racial privilege for white folks and white-looking folks. Right? Whether we're talking about the naturalization law of 1790, the first law passed by Congress after the Constitution was ratified, which said that whites and whites only could be free citizens of the United States or whether we're talking about the Homestead Act of 1860, which guaranteed white folks 160 acres of land for 10 bucks. It's a lot of land, if you're doing the math. <laughs> right? Where you all, black folks, y'all couldn't even get 40 acres and a mule. Or whether we're talking about federally subsidized, federally underwritten, federally guaranteed FHA and VHA loans, on the backs of those loans was the creation of the white middle class, and when you do that for black folks like you all, you know what they call it? Welfare. But when we do it for white folks, you know what they call it? Good, sound economic policy. Right? Especially in the age of, 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 of our current president. Right? And because of this systematic, institutionalized racial privilege, the average white family has 20 times the net worth of the average black family, 18 times the average net worth of the average Latinx family, 10 times the average net worth of the average Asian American family. We don't disaggregate Asian American. And in, our, in the American context, indigenous folks are not even on the radar. Right? And I want to give you an example of sort of how this inequality plays itself out before we move on and kind of talk about, well, what do we do about this? So my grandfather, grandfather-in-law, uh, fought in World War II with a white, this white man who became his brother because they're fighting together on the battlefield and it's life and death situations, so you can only imagine how close the bond is. And when they come back from the war, they said, hey, we would really love to live next to each other in the same neighborhood. So they settled in this place called Monterey, California. Very nice place. 
and they went to look for a house together. And the white brother found a house uh, in a place called Pebble Beach, California, on a street called 17 Mile Drive. And for those of you who know it, you must be smiling, right? Because it's a pretty incredible spot. And so they, he goes, he buys the house, he comes and tells my grandfather, I found this house, I got it, it's on 17 Mile Drive, the house next door is available, come and get it. Of course, my grandfather couldn't get it because of restricted covenants, because of redlining, because of blockbusting, because of all those kinds of things. And I want, I want to ask you all, how much do you think that house is worth today? That was World War II. 10 mil. 10 mil. 32 million. 32 million. Right? These are the invisible things that I think we forget about. 32 million. My grandfather's house, a couple miles away, Marina, Seaside, California area, 400,000. Bought at the same time. All of that structural racism, right, is going into the tutors, the healthcare, the dentists, the doctors, right, all kinds of forms of privileges and ways to get ahead. And the reason I put this up on the screen is when we look at the different treaties that were passed here, Waitangi, did I say that right? I'm trying. Waikatu, invasion of the Maori, native land, court splits up Maori land holdings. I really am trying to get at how whiteness, because a lot of times we're like, well, that's not happening here, or it's different here, right? And I really want to get at how whiteness has become property. This is Cheryl Harris's work that I really encourage you to look up. Whiteness in the United States context, and you can imagine the way that it's worked here, has always meant access to property rights. And property rights mean access to human rights, right? And what we see in the Maori population is an increase, of course, in the prison population that's disproportionate, disproportionate to who folks, the representation of that population. We see a decrease in home ownership, and this is how racism has become embedded in your society, from my Dedocphilian perspective, right? In terms of advantaging and privileging Pacquiao through, institu through institutions and through individual behaviors. Now, I think the Maori, Tongans, Samoans have been strong and steady and fierce in terms of fighting back, but what can we do collectively? Well, what if we build the next generation landscape architect movement at the intersection of social justice and ecology, of human rights and activism, of interchange and outer change, what if our next generation movement places opportunity in the center and commits to protecting our nation's most vulnerable populations? What if we don't just build hybrid cards? What if we build a hybrid landscape movement? And the second paradox I want to ask you all about is, can landscape architecture and architecture in general does it have the power to dismantle racism and promote gender equity by a show of hands? Skeptical. <laughs> Skeptical. Huh. All right, well, let's look at a couple of examples. Um, in the United States, we have Deanna Van Buren, who has the Designing for Justice project. She's running the country's first design studios with, with formerly incarcerated men and women. They've designed this beautiful building. On the first floor of the building, they've got a restaurant where formerly incarcerated folks are actually working, earning a living wage. On the second floor, they've got health care, not handcuffs. Housing is human rights. In Vienna, Austria, we saw folks that really designed for equity around gender and birth equity justice, making sure that following women and birthing people daily, widening the sidewalks, building ramps that strollers could actually get up instead of putting stairs there, putting extra lights to make neighborhoods safe, recognizing that parks were a place where at the age of nine, girls stopped playing in parks as much as boys. In Vienna, they did the research and they found this, so they had to change the landscape of the parks, change the kinds of activities that were offered in the parks, and they found that it really worked. In, in Vancouver, British Columbia, we see indigenous co-design principles at work, building something very similar to the library, but totally based on indigenous co-design principles and an indigenous worldview. 
Yesterday I met for about two and a half hours with, with Natahu around their own blueprint for the future. And I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about that, but how they're interested in using social innovation to create equity in education, in income, and in the economy. And I think my real central take home message to all of you is the way that landscape architecture can really dismantle racism and promote gender equity is we have to begin designing for equity in more systemic ways. We need to be we need to be more culturally and community responsive in our daily practices. And what I find really interesting about all of us in this room and the kind of work we do is that when we're asked to design for nature, and many of you might know this book, The Granite Garden, we seem to have no problem personifying nature. We seem to have no problem when we are asked to design with nature and be responsive to mountains and rivers and sea and wind and soil, we can do it. We have no problem. But when, when we're asked to be responsive to low-income communities, communities of color, vulnerable populations, folks that don't look like many of us, I think we struggle a lot more. And so my second message is we need to decolonize designers, landscape architects, planning, planners, and engineers and I think what this might look like is designing for justice, Netahu, Vienna, Bofa, Miskel, hope I said that right. And organizations like them are transforming lands the landscape architecture movement from top down technical approaches to bottom up community driven approaches that can co create agents of change and build equitable communities and equitable spaces and places for all. But how, the key question at the bottom of the screen is, how do you take this to scale? How does this go to scale? And we think the missing link is something that I refer to as techquity. And with techquity, the methodology of creating techquity is through people-powered placemaking. And what I mean by that is real-time, two-way communication with communities so they can participate in the design solutions that meet their daily needs. And so, Streetwise is a platform that we built to accomplish this goal. It's a disruptive technology platform and process. And it's a mobile mapping and SMS platform that collects real-time information about how people are navigating spaces and places and turns that into actionable analytics. And what I mean by that is, right now, we have good information that, say, Brad or Rachel live near a park. We have good geospatial information that they live near a park. And that's great. But what we really want to know is what is their experience in that park. Proximal information is great, but we want experiential information. That would help us design better. Is that the park where the drugs are sold? Is it safe enough to bring your children to the park? Do the swing sets even work at the park? And Streetwise is able to give both proximal information and experiential information, and you can toggle between the two as you wish. And in doing so, we're able to address these two key questions at the bottom of the screen, which is how do you democratize data and how do you democratize decision making? You can imagine our platform and process giving you all information. It's like a 360 degree view of what's happening beneath regulatory data sets. So for example, how walkable is my neighborhood? Right now, in the United States, we have something called walk score to answer that question. And walk score is great, but walk score doesn't differentiate between, th between things like liquor stores and corner stores. So you could be living in a so-called food swamp or a food desert and have a high walk score. Or walk score doesn't say that on the way to this meeting today that the men had no problem cutting through that alley over there, but women would never cut through that alley because that's where women are catcalled and sexually harassed. Right? My question to you is where is that kind of information, that kind of data that could help you plan better, that could help you design better? Where is that kind of data being picked up in any systematic way around the social determinants of health? Whether we're talking about public transit, how safe is the street, where can I buy affordable healthy food? What are the issues that people really care about in my community? And this is an example of Streetwise in action. What you're looking at right now is a public data set 
from the Alameda County uh, Public Health Department. This is what the mayor sees. This is what designers see. This is what architects see, where the purple dots represent the so-called number of grocery stores in the neighborhood that we talked about before. And as you can see from the public data, this neighborhood in East Oakland is a veritable food oasis. But when you ground truth that information with Streetwise, what you learn is, is that those aren't really grocery stores, they're liquor stores or corner stores. And only a handful are really grocery stores. And on Streetwise, you can upload pictures and audio and video, which is really important if you're working with low literacy populations, lower literacy populations, millennials, and quite frankly, just there's a lot of people that don't want a lot of text anymore. Right? So this is a very important innovation. And I just want to quickly play for you, this is the 1.0 version of Streetwise, but we wanted you to hear uh, a young woman in her neighborhood narrating the food environment. Okay, so what are you, let's see, um, what are you looking at? How was it when you went inside? It was dirty when I went inside and I would never eat anything in there. Do you consider this to be a grocery store? Hell no. Why? Because it's, they don't sell any groceries and it's just a bunch of junk food in there. And I mean, they have little sandwiches, but I would never eat that cause, because it's dirty. And then all the fruit is all like old, like wrinkly and looks old. And then all the like meat that they did have, like the bacon and all that in the little thing, looks like it's been sitting in there for about a year or something like that. I wouldn't call it a grocery store at all. So hell no, I wouldn't eat there. So right away, you can get a sense without even ever being in that neighborhood about how somebody is experiencing that community. And you can imagine how that could help you design better for that situation. And because, because of this kind of data, folks were able to put a farmer's market at that particular school when there wasn't a farmer's market there before. We went to the Cal Fresh Fund and we were able to go to each of the different liquor stores on the corner and change the food that they offered so that it was more fresh, culturally appropriate, and relevant for the young people and the older people who actually lived in the neighborhood. And part of that data was used to start a food commissary uh, for the people in the city of Oakland. So can we give those young people a hand? <laughs> Locally, uh, we've launched Streetwise in Auckland uh, at Key Air Aria. Did I say that right? Say it again. Aroha. Ki Aroha College with Ann Milne. And I really wanted to lift up her work, which has really been quite incredible about building the next generation of warrior scholars. And what we did there is we really looked at this question of does your postcode or does your zip code impact your life expectancy, your command over resources? Um, and of course, what we found is that there's a tale of two cities uh, in that community. Gun violence was a major, is a major issue in the community. So you had young people actually mapping the number of shootings. There were 10 shootings, six fatal, right around the school. And then in terms of good stuff, we started to map food access in the neighborhood using the Streetwise platform. We found that there were, we grew 66, mapped 66 food pantries. Uh, in the community that people didn't know about before. And so part of what's going on is we're creating this local knowledge ecosystem, right, for people to actually access food. And I think it works very similarly. Like there's five things that those of you who are from Christ Church know that the per person sitting next to you doesn't know, right? And Streetwise is able to share that information and, and create this local knowledge ecosystem. In terms of our national and international success, uh, President Obama did name myself, as you already know, because this is in the bio stuff, as one of the world's top innovators. That's me at the White House with uh, DJ Patil, the former chief data scientist of the Obama administration and the co-founder of Streetwise, Ekta Shah. We've gotten some great pubs in the press uh, around climate kick. We're in conversation with the European Union about launching Streetwise. We recently launched Streetwise with Google uh, and another company called Acclima last summer around air quality. And what we did is on top of Google Street View cars, we put air quality sensors. And as the Street View cars were driving through neighborhoods, we were collecting data 
on black carbon NOx and OX. And when we found a black carbon hotspot, which is represented by the purple dot, the Street View car is going too fast to tell you why it's a hotspot. So they called Streetwise and asked us if they could use our platform to really ground truth what was happening in that space and then take that information and connect that local data back with the big data. And what that means is we're collecting and have one of the most robust data sets around asthma and air quality and low income communities that you could possibly get. We're also working with enterprise community partners. They're the largest affordable housing provider uh, in the United States. They launched an opportunity index on housing powered in part by Streetwise. So we're helping them build uh, real-time data on housing. We're helping them create a, an evidence-based toolkit. We're helping them make it open source and we're helping them build a community engagement and partnership toolkit. We're mapping the geography of homelessness with homeless populations and we're just seeding your imagination with different ways that we're working. But who better to eradicate homelessness than homeless people themselves? And so that's been a really powerful project and what we learned is that libraries, and given there's an amazing library here, is one of those spaces and places that homeless people really spend a lot of time in, right? And so now we want to build the library differently so that it can, can accommodate homeless people's needs. Uh, we're in private beta, so we've launched, we're picking our partners. We're following a Yelp-like model. We've launched all across the United States, as well as internationally. Uh, in San Diego, California, we found arsenic in the water. And the policy win was to get rid of the arsenic in the water for school children. In Central Valley, we got better bus stops. We found a spatial mismatch between where people were living and where the bus stops were located. And so we fixed that and had better bus stops and better locations for low-income communities. And I, we already gave you the healthier food example. And the secret to our success has really been I don't know if you all have read this book by Brian Stevenson, but it's called Just Mercy. If you haven't read it, it's, it's a really an amazing book, so I'm recommending it. But he, he taught me that ultimately we will not be judged by our technology, by our design, by our intellect, by our reason. You judge a society not by how they treat the rich, the powerful, the privileged, but how we embody empathy and compassion and how we treat the poor, the condemned, and the most vulnerable because it is in that nexus that we begin to understand our collective humanity, who we are as a people and our purpose on the planet. And I came here today because I believe that the moral arc of the universe is long and bends towards justice, but only if we embody justice in, in our hearts and our minds and our daily actions when we're designing for equity. And that we cannot fully evolve as human beings until we start seeing environmental rights and human rights in a way that restore the dignity, humanity, and access to institutional resources for our, our nation's most vulnerable populations. I hope you join us in building a new community-driven data revolution that really begins to integrate the power of local knowledge and official knowledge in ways that help make landscape architecture movement more transparent, open, connected, smart, shareable, and equitable for all. Thank you so much.